Welcome to the program. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Coming up, the pandemic of loneliness. We take a look at the impact of isolation on older Australians and how concerned should we be about new variants emerging in Africa. But first, a vaccination milestone has been reached. More than half of Australians aged 16 and over are now fully vaccinated. The federal government says that's come at a faster per capita rate than what the UK, US, Germany and France achieved. Restrictions are expected to ease once vaccination targets of 70 and then 80 per cent are met under the plan agreed to by governments nationally. Let's get more now with Casey Briggs. Yeah, hi, Jeremy. Well, this it's taken seven months for us to get to 50% double dosed across Australia. Thankfully, it shouldn't take anywhere near that long to finish off the job. The seven day average of new doses being reported across the country, that is swinging upward at the moment. And of course, the targets, the 70%, the 80% target, there is a bit more urgency to meeting those in the states with active outbreaks. And they're the ones that are likely to hit those milestones first. First is likely to be New South Wales with a curve that's dropping at the moment. And the real question is how much lower can these case numbers be driven in really the next just two weeks? Because that's the time frame for hitting phase B. Uh, at the moment, the state's on track to get to 70% double dose on or around October the 5th. That would make October 11th the day that uh, restrictions start easing. Just about five days later than New South Wales, the ACT, with its remarkably static uh, outbreak at the moment, that, that territory too will hit 70% double dosed on or about October the 10th, so following fairly soon after New South Wales. Hopefully this, this curve can be kept relatively static up to that point and beyond, but another territory that's well on the way. And then Victoria, of course, with its 700 cases on Thursday and Friday, uh, is on track to hit this 70% mark, more like late October. Hopefully we'll see a, a real reduction in these case numbers much sooner than that. Uh, what we're seeing is still an escalation in the curve uh, day on day, but the growth rate, uh, the rate at which that uh, the, the, the epidemic, the pandemic, the outbreak is, is growing in Victoria has been slowing down. Even with these couple of big days, it still looks to be at the very worst, stabilising potentially still slowing as well. Uh, hopefully that vaccine aided bending in the curve will come soon. Uh, what could be a stumbling block is the city of Hume, where most of the cases in Victoria remain, has a below average vaccination rate for Melbourne. And so that could be a problem going forward. But hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see that bend too well in time for the cases to start coming down before that late October date when we, hit, when we reach 70%. Casey, thank you. Lockdowns are leaving many people isolated and for some older Australians, it's increasing a feeling of loneliness. Philip Armstrong is the Chief Executive of the Australian Counselling Association. He joins us now. Philip Armstrong, welcome to the program. This week, Melbourne became the city with more days in lockdown than anyone else in the world. What impact have these prolonged periods of isolation had on older Australians? Thank you. Welcome. Um, Jeremy, the, uh, the, the, the primary impact is obviously it's loneliness, but also the mental health issues that uh, come with loneliness, but also significant uh, you know, isolation from family, uh, carers and uh, you know, uh, vitally important people within the, their lives, particularly uh, even things such as uh, people help them with their cooking, cleaning uh, and uh, even mobility issues. A lot of this has been compounded too, hasn't it, by these voluntary lockdowns we've seen in nursing homes mm -hmm. as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, you also have the fear factor. I mean, uh, what we do know is particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, um, that uh, uh, particularly initially being in a, uh, an aged care facility wasn't exactly one of the safest places you could be. Tell me what that fear factor means for people who are older Australians. They might be out, out of the workforce or not living with family necessarily. Uh, we certainly you'd have um, isolation issues. Uh, you'd be feeling extremely lonely. But you'd be the, the fear factor is, is there's several things you, you're fearful of. One is um, you're fearful of being by yourself lonely, and uh, particularly the worst case scenario, dying by yourself, dying dying without human contact. Um, that that's a, a terrible thought for for anybody. But the fear of actual contact. I mean, the fear is that if you are in contact with people, you're the most vulnerable people who are potentially going to be significantly ill and die. Remembering that a lot of these people. You know, the government keeps saying, oh, you, you're fine uh, unless you've got underlying issues. How many 70-year-olds don't have underlying issues? So what is the tonic to all that, the loneliness and that fear factor that you talk about? Um, well, what we have to do is, A, we need to uh, build some confidence within the aged uh, uh, population. I mean, the aged population have been 
absolutely inundated with conflicting uh, issues, conflicting evidence, conflicting. You know, I mean, most of these people get their information from uh, free to free to air television. Uh, you know, a lot of them don't use um, uh, the mobiles, so they don't use modern technology. So they're getting the information from the news and the news, depending on which channel you're watching uh, or which news program you're watching, uh, a very conflicting information is coming through those. And um, so what we need to do is to get some uh, some consistent information, tell them that, that uh, you know, A, vaccines are safe, B, B, contact is safe, and C, we do care and we're looking after their mental health. Philip Armstrong, so good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we near our vaccination targets, attention is turning to boosters. So how would they work? These 21 countries have something in common. Less than 1% of their populations are vaccinated against COVID-19. But it's an entirely different story for these countries, where vaccination rates are high and people are lining up for an extra dose. Australia's Health Minister Greg Hunt has said we can expect a booster 12 months after our first vaccinations. But not all experts are convinced we even need a booster just yet. Majority of vaccines, regardless of whether they're for COVID or any other disease, um, your antibody level starts waning. That's where a booster comes in. We get boosters for tetanus and whooping cough. And new data from Israel is building the case for COVID boosters. Let's say someone was double dose vaccinated in April. By July, their protection against symptomatic infection was on average down to 79%. But for those vaccinated the previous January, three months earlier, protection was just 16%. That's a 63% drop in four months. The same study also showed vaccines are still very good at keeping people out of hospitals with 91% effectiveness against severe infection no matter when you had the vaccination. From the very beginning, that was the main goal. The goal originally was to protect the healthcare system and to do that by preventing severe illness and death. So the question might not be whether we need a booster shot, but who needs a booster shot and when? There are a few groups of people in whom an additional dose of vaccine appears to be very important. One study looked at people in the US who've had organ transplants and are fully vaccinated. It found they're 82 times more at risk of a breakthrough infection, getting COVID even after being immunised, and it found they're a staggering 480 times more at risk of becoming seriously ill. These are people who have immunocompromising conditions that just don't respond to the two doses of vaccine sufficiently well to be protected. The more imminent threat is the potential for new variants, and experts say boosters are not the best way to deal with them. All the variants of concern, Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta, emerged before large numbers of people started getting vaccinated. That burden of infection in unvaccinated people is what's going to drive the emergence of new variants. Every time the virus infects someone, it creates copies of itself inside the body. Every once in a while, the copy goes slightly wrong, potentially making it more potent. So the more the virus spreads, the more opportunity it has to evolve into new variants. If Delta has taught us anything, it's that the virus doesn't have borders. That's why the World Health Organization has made its stance on booster vaccines very clear. It's like saying, OK, you have a life jacket and you're adding one, uh, another one, while others uh, don't have uh, a single uh, life jacket. So far, the US has shipped 114 million vaccine doses to countries in need out of the 500 million doses it pledged. Pledges do not put vaccines into people's arms. I think we want real vaccines, and not just pledged vaccines. But even if those pledges are met, countries that desperately need vaccines will fall short. 11 billion doses are needed to fully vaccinate 70% of the world against COVID-19. As of September, only about half have been given. We're still in a pandemic of the unvaccinated. 
So while the majority of the world remains unvaccinated, experts say the priority for most people should be getting two doses into arms, not three. African leaders have warned of what they're calling a vaccine apartheid, with several nations on the continent yet to receive enough doses for their citizens, while wealthier countries are giving boosters to theirs. Dr Michelle Groom is from South Africa's National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Dr Groom, with some countries already giving boosters, what does that mean for vaccine equity and access? You know, managing this pandemic is, is a global problem. And I think um, in terms of, of the first you know, objective should be trying at least for, for the world to have received their primary vaccine series before we start looking at boosters. Um, so obviously that's my, my take on that. And I think South Africa may, I'm not too sure in terms of the other African countries, but definitely as a continent, you know, we have very low vaccine coverage and, and there is that potential then for, for new variants potentially to emerge. Um, and so, yeah, I think while the rest of the world is looking to boosters, I think we need to really start looking at getting everyone at least vaccinated with a primary series. You mentioned new variants. A lot of scientists are now closely watching this new C12 variant. It seems to share some characteristics with Delta. How concerned are you about it? Yeah, yeah. So we detected that um, I think a month or two ago, and obviously a, a lot of that was in the media as um, it seemed to share. Well, it does share a lot of the mutations um, between Delta and and Beta, and a couple of new mutations. So I think that it, you know initially that was concerning. I think what we have seen is that, um, you know, with with uh, the previous two variants of concern that we saw, you know, we, we saw low levels and then suddenly we saw increases in, in the um, proportion, which we haven't seen this time. Um, and so it remains a very small proportion of all of our, of our sequences. And actually, I think that was just under 3% in um in July and was actually lower last month, um, which is encouraging in that it doesn't seem to be increasing its proportion. We actually have some early data, um, which I think will be released in the next couple of days in terms of um, some of our neutralization testing, which shows it has a similar, um, you know, a neutralization. So there is some fall off in terms of neutralization um, after vaccination, but very similar to, to beta and delta. And quite interesting that prior infection with the beta and delta variant actually gives cross protection against the C.1.2 variant, which I think is very encouraging and may well, you know, be the reason that it's not taking off um, because I think we, we obviously were exposed to beta in the second wave and delta in the third. And if that offers cross protection, I, I think, you know, that it's, it's unclear that it would have any significant advantage over delta. So I think encouraging that those proportions are going down. What's that nexus been like between easing restrictions in South Africa with Delta still circulating in the community? So I think we did see um, a relatively big third wave, um, which was mainly driven by the Delta variant. Um, so this, you know, we detected Delta in, in around March and, and then this really just took off um, around June. Um, and so we saw, you know, we've seen quite a lot of differences in terms of uh, the different provinces as well and how they've um, reacted in this wave. And so provinces um, that weren't very much affected in, in say, the second of our waves um, were had, saw large case numbers this time around, and that was driven, you know, largely by Delta. So as you know, I mean, the Delta variant um, transmissibility has increased significantly compared um, to the other variants of concern. Um, and our second wave was was driven a lot by by the beta variant and definitely this third wave by the delta variant. Um, and I think quite striking with this wave is that, you know, because of these provincial differences, um, it was quite, you know, sustained. We saw sustained cases for longer than we'd seen for the second wave. Um, and so um, our biggest province is Kateng, and we saw quite, you know, a large surge there, but, you know, the other provinces followed. Um, and so it's really only been in the last two weeks that we've seen a decrease in the number of cases finally um, and have been able to, to um, you know, ease on the restrictions. Dr. Groom, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> And that is the show for this week. Don't forget, you can catch up anytime on ABC iView. We'll have more for you this time next week. For now, thanks for your company. Goodbye.